stand up and give the message to the people of God. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we come before you because we need you. Lord, we ask your blessings upon us, each and every one of us. Lord, we need you more than we know, but we know that you are near. We ask your blessings upon us. We ask that you anoint us with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you guide and direct us into all truth, that when you come in the clouds of heaven, we will shout and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Save us, we ask and pray. For in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. I was a little conflicted when I was asked to speak because there were two verses that kept popping up in my head as, as sort of contextual verses, something to, to, and forgive me, I have a habit of walking. I'm a, I'm a very nervous talker, so I've got to walk to, to sort of break down the, the nervousness. Um, one of the texts you read this morning, the other text is Psalm 7713. If we could turn to 7713. And it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You know, the sanctuary is what is the unique doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists. There are other denominations who believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath. There are other denominations, many in fact, who believe that the Lord is coming soon. But it is the sanctuary doctrine that is what is unique about us. It is really the sanctuary doctrine that, that defines us. We need to understand why the sanctuary doctrine is important because it is, in essence, the message that God has given us as a people to take to the world. The sanctuary doctrine explains why sin still exists. The sanctuary doctrine describes why the Lord has not come yet. The sanctuary doctrine tells us what we have to do, the decisions that we have to make, how we affect the eternal destiny of everyone. You see, the great controversy, how do I want to say this? It's the most logical thing in the universe. The great controversy, how did it all begin? We all know that there was a perfect heaven and, and, and there was no sin in, in God's existence. Then Satan came up with this idea that he could do it better, that everything God said wasn't necessarily, necessarily the best. And I, I do in a way want to emphasize that point because Satan's first lie wasn't that God, how do I want to say this, it wasn't that God was wrong, it was just that he could do it better. And I want to emphasize that point because that's often, that's often how we think. You know, God says X, X is good, but uh, it's maybe not necessary. Does God really mean everything that he says? But God being God, and you got to love God, God being God, he decided to answer that question. He decided to let Satan's ideas play out. And he was going to give us evidence that everything that God says, everything that he says is true. That is, in essence, the great controversy. And that is, in essence, what each and every one of us is playing out in their life. Do you believe that God is true? Do you believe that everything God says is accurate? He says, come now, let us reason together. He wants us to reason. He wants us to understand. Because, you know, once this great controversy is over, there's going to be no more questions because all the questions will have been answered. All your questions will be answered. You know, we talk about the Sabbath day. We, we, we love the Sabbath day. But do we really keep it holy? Or do we, and I, uh, let me say, if, if I mention a sin, it's because it's a sin that I'm, I'm battling with. But we talk about the Sabbath day, we keep the Sabbath day holy, but... You know, when Clemson is playing on a Saturday afternoon, is your mind on God or is it on what the score is? God wants to save us. God is answering our questions, so not only now, but all through eternity, 
We will have the answer. God means what he says, and what he says is best for us. What he says is the only right answer for us, for each and every one of us, not only as a people, not only as a church, but for us individually. God means what he says. And we can talk about, yes, we all know that, but when it comes to the nitty-gritty, do we really believe that? Again, I can go back to, I'm not so much a football lover, I'm more of a basketball lover, but on Friday nights, is my mind on God or is it on the NBA playoffs? Come on, let's be serious here. We say we love God, we say we keep his Sabbath day holy, but where is our mind? What are we thinking about? Because through all eternity, through all eternity, and I cannot emphasize this enough, through all eternity, we must understand that God means what he says. We must understand that everything that God says is true, as in, it is important, it is vital. For all eternity, the question, the, the tongue tight, the answer to the question will be, God is right. The reason why God has not come yet is because we and when I say we, I'm not talking about the world out there. I'm talking about each and every one of us in this Seventh-day Adventist church. Whether you're looking on Zoom or here in the, the sanctuary personally, each and every one of us is, is battling with that question. When God says, I don't know, when God says, you know, to, 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 don't look at certain things on television. Because by beholding, we become changed. Do we really believe God means it? Or do we mean, like I said, I can put myself out here. My favorite television show, forgive me for this, of all time. Well, I won't, I won't talk about it. it <laughs> but seriously, everything, the, the murders that we see on television, the adulteries that we see on television, the sitcoms, and we laugh. We are polluting our very own minds to like this sin. We are desensitizing it to the evil that it is. And we think we're going to go to heaven? We think we're going to be saved while we love that sin? We are fooling ourselves. This is the, not only the probation time, this is the training time. Do you like the things of God? How many of you believe that there's going to be an eternally burning hell? Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand, and that's, well, one person, but there's, no going to, there's not going to be an eternally burning hell. We're going to, the sinner is eventually going to cease to exist. But you know what an eternally burning hell would be? If we, in our unconverted state, were given eternal life and forced, and I will use the word forced, to live in the presence of God. Seriously, many of us, I used the example of football before, many of us, we can't go a Saturday afternoon without thinking about football. You know what would be eternal torment for us? A world where there's no football on Saturday afternoons. Many of us can't turn off the television and study the Bible. You know what would be eternal torment for us? If everyone around us was a Bible character, and the only thing they talked about was the Lord. We might get mad when we, when we think about that and like that, but that's what it is. You know what the great thing about hell is? It's the second best alternative. And I sincerely mean that, because in our unconverted state, unless we are converted, Heaven would be eternal torment for us. But God loves us. This probationary time is a time when we can change. It's a time when we can learn of his love, that great sacrifice that he made on Calvary. So each and every one of us not only can be with him, but can enjoy being with him. Turn with me in your Bible. I'm going to skip the first one I have here. But turn with me to Romans 1, verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, maliciousness, full of envy, 
murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which, tongue-tied, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do. How many of us, and I can go back to television or anything, how many of us take delight in some of the things that are on television that we really should not be watching, that we really should not be enjoying? And you're enjoying that now, and you may think nothing of it, but again, it's not going to be there in heaven. So why are you enjoying it now? You are training your mind to enjoy adultery. You are training your mind to enjoy violence. And when there's none around, you're going to be depressed and bored. So why would you want heaven? Like I said, the, the, the second best alternative out there is hell. But let's try for heaven. Let's start training our minds to enjoy the things of God. You know, how many of us really enjoy sitting down and looking through the Bible, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little? What the great controversy is, is the acknowledgement or the ultimate acknowledgement that everything that God says is correct. Turn with me in your Bibles, Philippians 2, verses 10 through 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Quick question, what is, when is this happening? What, what time period is this, what time period is this talking about? Is this talking about when Jesus comes again? Raise your hand if you believe that Jesus, this is talking about when Jesus comes again. I'm glad that no one raised their hand because it's not. It's talking about a thousand years later after the great controversy. Because again, what the great controversy is, it's the answer to is God correct about everything? You know, I remember in, uh, wow, this is really a long time ago, probably the 70s, when I first became an Adventist, at least, Joe Cruz, the, um, I forgot the name of his series, his, his Bible studies. I remember there was a picture, and one of the pictures in, the, uh, in that Bible study was a picture of Satan bowing before Jesus. And what it was referencing is what we just read there. See, after the great controversy, every the case, tongue tied, every case is decided, and every created intelligence acknowledges that God was correct. In fact, the only difference between you and I and the lost, the only difference between you and I and Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler or whomever, is that we acknowledge, hopefully, that we are acknowledging that God is correct now that everything that God says is true and righteous now. Because there's going to come a time when everyone, the saved as well as the lost, will acknowledge it. That is the great controversy. God is correct. Like I say, it, it, I, I, am, I am flabbergasted by the logic of it. There was a question. God, are you really, really accurate? Are you really, really true when you say this? And God, in his infinite love and tender mercy, not only for us, but for every created intelligence, said, try me. I will give you the evidence now, and he is giving us the evidence now, to prove that, yes, he is correct. We can reject the evidence, or we can accept the evidence. But he is presenting the evidence now. In every detail of your life, is he correct? In every detail of your life, he is proving that should you tell the truth or should you lie? Should you cheat 
or should you be honest? And in theory, we all say, oh, we should always tell the truth. We should always be truthful. We should never lie. But let's play it out in each and every facet of our lives. Yes, we need to tell the truth. Yes, we need to be honest in every facet of our lives. Because if in one facet, we can, and I, I want to use air quotes here for, for those who are only listening, if in one facet of life we can prove that God's way is not the best way, then God loses, the Lord loses the entire great controversy. But he is looking to us, he has called us to prove that he is correct. In every facet of life, can you tell the truth? In every facet of life, can you not lust? In every facet of life, can you be honest and reflect his character? Again, that is the great controversy. In every aspect of our lives, we're either proving God correct or we are proving him wrong. The question is, what more could Christ do for us? He sacrificed his very own life that we may have the opportunity and the power and the grace to be with him, to reflect his character, to prove him correct. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 5, verse 4. The question that he asked, what more could he have done for us? What more could he have done for my vineyard, that I have not done in it. Wherefore, when I looked, that it bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. When he looks to us to prove that everything that he says is correct, are we proving him correct? That is our part to play in the great controversy, to trust in him and to obey him. That despite what we may think in our finite knowledge, in our limited understanding of what's really going on, do you trust in God when you've got every reason to believe what he's saying is not true? That maybe if I lie, I'll be okay. That maybe if I, 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 you know, I, I don't have money now, so if I take this extra money from, I don't know where, the, 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 my mother's dresser drawer, it's okay. God will understand. In every facet of life, we are here to prove that God is correct. When he says, thou shalt not steal, he doesn't say, thou shalt not steal unless you really, really need the money. Thou shalt not steal. His word is correct in every circumstance. Because again, this is not playing out just for time. This is not playing out for 6,000 years. This is going to be the message through all eternity. In every circumstance, in every situation, God is correct. Again, that is the essence of the great controversy. And he doesn't leave us alone as he gives us the opportunity to prove him correct. He is with us. He is empowering us. All power. In fact, let's look at that. Ma Matthew 28, 18. Talk of Jesus when he was resurrected. As he came forth from the grave, he said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. He didn't say most power. He didn't say a lot of power. He said all power. And that all power includes the power by his grace to live a righteous life and to prove him correct. There is no higher calling in the universe. We are to stand on the Lord's side. In everything we do, we are to give God the glory. In everything we do, we are to prove that God is correct that everything he says and does is not simply for the best, it is 
the best? And that is the question that we need to be asking ourselves each and every moment of our lives as we, as we go to the store, as we go to our jobs, whatever we do, we are there to prove that God is true, that God is right. Turn with me in your Bibles. Let's keep, excuse me, my apologies. Turn to Proverbs 4, verse 23. Actually, first, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Many of you may know this. I know it's a favorite verse for many. Whether, therefore, ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And also from there to Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, even in what we say and what we think, we are to reflect the, the glory of God. Excuse me. Again, we are his witnesses. We are his ambassadors. We are here not simply to prove to our fellow man and woman, but also to the heavenly intelligences that God is correct in everything. In every facet of life, in every situation you can be in, God has provided the answer. God has given you the answer to overcome, to reflect his character, to be with him for eternity. Because again, as I was saying, if we don't have the character of God, how do we expect to live in his presence? And I'm assuming we all want to, we all want to be saved, don't we? Raise your hand if you want to be saved. Now we do realize that that means we will be in the presence of God for eternity. And again, I go back, what makes us think that we can be in the presence of God, that we would want to be in the presence of God, when we would, don't want to obey him, when we don't want to be like him, when despite what we say, we don't want to love him, we just really just love the things he can do for us. But if you really love Jesus, if you really love our Father who art in heaven, you want to spend time with him. You want to know more of him. Maybe the question I shouldn't ask, but I will ask it anyway, how often do we spend time in our Bibles? You know, I can talk, to, talk about this as someone who is, my wife will tell you, battling, I don't think I watch it that much, but battling television watching. <laughs> but 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm doing anything besides the word of God, I would be better off reading and studying the word of God. And I will be so bold as to say, most of you can say the same thing. Take a serious inventory of yourself. How much time do you spend watching television or gossiping or doing whatever when you could be studying what the word of God is? In fact, I'll put myself on blast here. You know, in, in, our, in our Sabbath school lessons, there is a, uh, you know, the first little quote, it says, this is a memory text. I'm not even going to ask how many of you study the Sabbath school lesson. I'll go a little step beyond that and say, how many of us actually memorize the memory text? You know, we're going to have Sabbath school here in the afternoon. Let, let's for the class, you've got time, let's, let's all memorize it. Because seriously, many of us, we get on our kids, I don't have kids, but still, we get on children for not memorizing the memory text, but are we giving them a good example? I probably should get off of that. Turn with me in your Bible. It won't be long. Turn with me in to Luke 16, verse 10. And it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. In everything we do, we are to reflect the grace, the power, the love of Jesus. And every time 
no matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter what the activity or even the thought is, that we do not follow and thus saith the Lord. We are being unfaithful and proving, in air quotes, proving that Satan is correct. This great controversy is serious. For all eternity, the Lord has put it up to us to prove who is right. Because that's what happens at the end of eternity. You know, when Jesus comes back, not the second time, but the third time, after the millennium, after the thousand years, when every knee shall bow, that includes the lost as well as the saved. Every question is answered. What side are you going to be on? Because that is what the great controversy comes down to. And that is, what it com that is what it comes down to in your life. What side are you on? Do you believe God when everything is going right? Or do you trust him when you don't see the way? Do you believe that God knows what he's talking about when every neuron in your brain says you should do X, but the word of God says Y? That's what the great controversy is. And again, in each and everything that we do, we're either on God's side or we're on Satan's side. You know what the unpardonable sin is? Turn with me in your Bible. Because it's mentioned in two places, actually. Uh, the first is Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. And, 30, and 25, excuse me. Is that Matthew 12? Yes, yeah, sorry. Matthew 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy, blasphemy excuse me, shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And going back to 25, to put it in a context, and Jesus knew their thoughts, because they weren't saying it, they were thinking it, and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. You know, the reason I bring this up, oh, sorry, there's another verse. If we could turn to Matthew 10, tongue tight, Hebrews 10, verse 26. Because that's the other place where it talks about the unpardonable sin. Although it doesn't use the phrase, the unpardonable sin, if you read it, that is exactly what it's talking about. And it says, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. We have this habit of thinking the unpardonable sin is this, this great, magnificent, blasphemous thing. But each and every time that the Spirit of God tells you to do something and you don't do it, or the reverse, tells you not to do something, and you do it. I, I'm trying to use my words carefully here. You're not absolutely lost, but you're dimming that voice of the Holy Spirit. What the unpardonable sin is, is that you ignore the Spirit of God so often that you can no longer hear him you have cut, your, cut off your own means of salvation. And I say that and I emphasize that because, again, it's not a great thing. It's not a, 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 a magnificent thing that, you know, the sky opens up and says you did something really wrong. It's in those quiet moments, again, where God says X, but we want to do Y. And we keep doing that to the point where God can no longer, no longer touch us.
We need to understand that this is serious. That everything that God tells us is important. And that we are in this battle not simply for time, but for all eternity. The Lord has risked it all for you. He sacrificed himself on Calvary for you. We need to step back and think about that for a second. The Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, for all eternity, bears the marks of the crucifixion. That is how serious and costly your salvation cost him. That is how important it is, and that that is how all-encompassing it is. The Lord says, he that is not with me is against me. There is no middle ground. But I would like to implore each and every one of us here to choose the Lord. In everything we say, in everything we do, we need to choose the Lord. Because it's all important. For all eternity, you are making your decisions now. And if you can't be trusted in the little things, we can't be trusted with eternity. Letta? Closing? I'm sorry. I... You know what? I'm sorry. I'll give her a moment. You know, it said that the word of God should never be preached without an altar call. Uh, I would like to ask us all if we are willing to give it all to the Lord, if we're willing to stand on his side in everything, great and small, may I ask you to stand as we bow our heads. I'll give a brief benedictory prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you because we need you. Bless us, we pray. In everything, help us to choose you. Remind us of your great sacrifice as well as your great power. Keep us, we pray. Help us, we pray. And thank you, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.